it really is something that we're so committed to at my production company is sort of reorienting ourselves around the idea of otherness because we for so long have taken for granted that certain people belong at the center of the story and a lot of it has to do with that straight white male gaze um, and orientation and what if we decide that everyone is at the center of their own story that everyone is the hero of their own journey what do our stories look like when we have a commitment to make that true? I'm Prerna Gupta, a tech founder, and in this series, I'll explore how exceptional people succeed by following their hero's journey. Hi, Carrie. Welcome to Hero's Journey, and thanks for joining. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. You are a hero to so many young women who have been inspired by your journey, especially women of color like me. When, <laughs> when did you know that you wanted to be an actress and what made you believe it's possible? I always did acting as an extracurricular activity. I was a very dramatic child. And so my mom very smartly, very intelligently um, put me in all kinds of after school theater company type programs just so I could get all those emotions out of my system. Mm -hmm. But I really loved living in that space. I loved living in a space of imagination. Um, I never thought that acting would be a career for me. Um, it really was a hobby. And it wasn't until I was doing a summer conservatory program. So it was a, a program where I was really studying acting in a much more kind of full-time way in between my sophomore and junior years of um, undergrad. And I learned about actors unions and I hadn't known that there were unions for actors, but I come from a family. My mom's a teacher, a retired professor. So I knew about teachers unions and I knew that unions were for working people. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, if there's a union for actors, it must mean that enough people are able to kind of make a living to do this as a career, even though we never see them like on the cover of a magazine or maybe their name in lights. It still means like there's a way to make a living doing what I love doing, even if I never become famous. And so that's what made me feel like I'm going to go for it because I didn't want to be famous. I just wanted to be able to spend my life doing something that I really, really loved to do. That's so beautiful and I think speaks to to why you're so good at it. You know, you're you're such an incredibly talented actor and it's because it really came from a place of love and, and a place of passion and not necessarily for all of the rewards that come from from being successful in it. Well, I think it also came from a place of of wanting to work, you know, not wanting to like Sometimes I think people imagine that what you do as an actor is you just like sit around all day and feel feelings while people feed you grapes and fan you with feathers. <laughs> like, and the truth is, you know, at the height of, of scandal, for example, I was often working 16, 17 hour days and you put in a lot of time and effort, you know, that didn't include the hour and a half that I would spend coming home to memorize lines. Now, I'm not saying that my job is the hardest job in the world. I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not a grave digger. I'm not like, you know, if I don't go to work, people might feel uninspired for a day. Like if my <laughs> trash collector doesn't go to work, like we all get sick. So like there are jobs that are a lot more important than mine. But I think that when we come to something with the willingness to work, at it, to put our effort, to, um, to be disciplined and um, committed. I think for me, the reward is greater because I'm not actually coming at it, as you said, to receive accolades because I can never control those accolades. Yeah. What I can control is my work ethic, my commitment and my, um, my discipline. Wise words and so inspiring. So, so every great hero needs a mentor. Who have been key mentors to you in your journey? And is it true that JLo taught you how to dance? <laughs> yes, I could say, well, so I grew up in the same neighborhood as Jennifer Lopez. We both grew up in the Castle Hill Sound View area of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And we both went to the same boys and girls club. Um, the Boys and Girls Club was a really, really important part of my childhood. You know, I had two parents who worked full time. And so 
the Boys and Girls Club is where I went after school in those hours between where my public school education hours, those were done, but my parents couldn't pick me up yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my mom actually lied when I was little to because I was one year too young to be able to join the Boys and Girls Club. She was like, you'll be fine. Um, and I had older cousins with me, so I was I was safe. Um, but we had at, at the Kipps Bay Boys and Girls Club in the Bronx, we had this extraordinary dance teacher his name was Larry Maldonado. Mm -hmm. He was just a dream. You know, he really encouraged all of us black and brown girls to understand our worth, our value, our beauty. You know, I always think arts education, we think about arts education in the wrong ways often. I think arts education isn't about creating the next JLo or the next Kerry Washington, actually. Mm -hmm. Arts education is about creating the, the next best human beings to solve our most important problems, right? Because at the Boys and Girls Club, I learned about showing up. I learned about courage. I learned about teamwork. I learned about curiosity. I learned about how to be on time, how to keep trying, perseverance, right? And those were those were the skills that were being passed on to us from Larry, our dance teacher. And Jennifer was at the same club. Um, Larry was one of the very first people I knew as a kid in the 80s who was impacted by HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when Larry found himself in the hospital for weeks and months at a time, Jennifer was one of the older girls and she stepped in to teach some of our classes. So she's, I don't, you know, she wasn't like, she was more of a big sister than a teacher, (laughs) um, but she, she was, I did get to study dance with Jennifer and you would think I'd be better at it because (laughs) of it, but that's, that's no uh, lack on her part. That's definitely a lack on my part. (laughs) But, you know, I've had, I've been really lucky to have all different kinds of mentors in my life because I think also, you know, when you grow and, and you have a curiosity to explore other areas of interest, other verticals, um, then it's important to find lots of different kinds of mentors. So I've been really lucky in the social justice work that I do to have just phenomenal mentors out in the world, people who are doing just extraordinary work. Um, like, you know, I, there are two people that, that come to mind always for me when I get this question, just incredible, incredible leaders. Tram Wynn, who is the executive director of the new Virginia majority and Art Reyes, who is the executive director of We The People in Michigan. And both of these people are just un wavering in their dedication to the community, just like so fully committed to honoring the voice of the people and to transforming our democracy to be really more inclusive. So when I come to the advocacy work, I always worry that I I never want to make it about me. You know, I don't want to go into a neighborhood and say like, I'm Kerry Washington, you should vote because I tell you to, or like, I'm Kerry Washington, you should, you know, run for office because I played Olivia Pope and I know what that means. It's like, no, it's really about coming to a community and figuring out how to listen to the voices on the ground and be guided by those voices. So leaders like Tram and like Art, they really do the work of uplifting those local voices. They are those local heroes that I really go to again and again to teach me how to be led by the needs of a community. That's amazing. And I think it, um, you know, it just shows, like I said, I mean, every great hero needs a mentor and and just your ability to seek out these mentors and be open to learning from them and your desire to continue to learn in new areas. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned this, but you have used your platform to do some incredible social impact work. And in the areas of democracy, voter participation, racial justice, the most important issues of our time. Tell us a little bit about some of your recent efforts in this area and why this work is so important to you. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um... <laughs> Working with folks like Tram and Art has been really helpful to me because even though I I really try to come to that work in the spirit of service, right? Like, what can I do for you and your community? How can I uplift? How can I take some of these eyeballs or ears that are pointed toward me and point them toward you? But of course, I get so much more (laughs) out of the relationship than they do um, because they have so much to teach. And and so one of the really exciting things that's happened is that working with Tram and Art has really inspired me to launch a cohort, which is in partnership with the Movement Voter Project, 
which provides resources to 10 grassroots organizations all across the country to help drive, drive change in those communities. So together we designed a two-year program to give organizations the money, the resources, you know, capital and other kinds of resources to build their storytelling and their digital strategy and visual communications expertise, right? Like things that are more in my core competency, but that I know these organizations need to better reach their audiences and to scale their impact in the world. So figuring out like, what are my superpowers? What are their superpowers? How do we, how do we help each other? And more importantly, how do I help them? Incredible. And I think it's really smart, you know, rather than saying, I think a lot of people who go into philanthropy kind of think about it's all about me and I'm doing this because I want to make myself seem like a great person, but your insight that there are all these other organizations that are doing amazing work and what can I do to support them, I think is is so smart and it, it's cool to see just the leverage that you're able to have. It's like being an investor in the startup world, you know, a venture investor says, I'm going to have leverage by investing in and supporting all these other incredible founders doing this work and you're sort of doing the same thing. They are founders, right? I mean, these grassroots leaders, they truly are founders that they've proven the most effective way to create change is to start at the ground level. And so it's it's been phenomenal to learn from them, to support them, to leverage my platform, to help them make a difference because they are the founders doing the work that's most important right now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So kind of going back to your, you know, career and experience as an actor, you've played so many diverse roles and played them so convincingly. For example, Kay Amin in The Last King of Scotland, it was such a powerful role and you were amazing. Tell us a little bit about how you prepare for a role like that. What kind of research goes into it? You talked about showing up and doing the work. You know, what is that work? I think a lot of us who aren't in your industry don't know that, you know, give us a peek behind the curtain. What goes into it and how do you learn to do a new accent? (laughs) Um, Oh, it's so funny. I mean, there's lots of different ways to approach building a character. Um, And every character also requires a different approach. I have found in my career, you know, there is really... I think I I hate to talk about acting as an art sometimes because it makes it sound so, I don't know, pretentious, but there is something artful to it, meaning it's not an exact science. Mm -hmm. You really have to be willing to kind of play and experiment and and be fluid and flexible and curious and open-minded and committed and, Mm -hmm. and hungry. And you just, for me, I really try to build as much truth in detail about who the person is Mm -hmm. so that I can try to step into those shoes. It's like, you have to make the shoes in order to walk in them. Mm -hmm. So making the shoes of the character means understanding like who they are, where they live, what they need, how they talk, what they eat, who are they close to, what are their secrets? Um, All of those things help me to sort of imagine myself and lead my imagination into thinking that I could be somebody else for small chunks of the day. I don't want you to think I actually go crazy. Um, but those, you know, that's kind of the the whimsical weirdness of what we do is that it's, there's no exact science to it, but I'm constantly trying to give myself enough information about who the character is that I can suspend my disbelief and hopefully yours. Yeah. And learning an accent is always really, really helpful. There are all these physical things that I can do to help me enter into a character. Sometimes how I figure out who they are is how they walk, right? Like playing Anita Hill, for example, in Confirmation, Anita has such a specific walk and posture. And it taught me a lot about her to figure out how to embody that walk. Playing Kay Amin, the accent taught me so much and it just helped me to find the rhythms of how people speak in Uganda. So I did work with an accent coach. Um, Actually first, Whitaker and I worked with the same accent coach in the beginning because we wanted to make sure that we were approaching it in the same way. Um, But then I just spent as much time as I could with women in Uganda, you know, getting my hair braided, going shopping, making friends, spending time with people's family, babysitting kids, like just throwing myself into the community to try to pick up all the the music of the language and the nuances of the culture. That's so cool. So you you hear, I mean, you mentioned, you know, I don't want you to think I go crazy when I'm preparing for these roles. And we, I've heard of 
some actors that, you know, when they're preparing, they just kind of become that person for the period of time that they're playing that character, you know, is that your approach or do you really, do you kind of go in and out in a day? Um, and once the role is over, do you feel like, does, is it different? You know, like, do you feel like, okay, it takes you some time to kind of come back to center and come back to like who you are at your core? I would say yes, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the interesting things is that in earlier on in my career, I think I was much more of a kind of method actor, meaning I would throw myself into a character and there was very little distinction between her reality and mine. I think I, I, um, I didn't trust myself as much as an artist. And so I really felt like I had to keep her, the character with me all the time, all the time, all the time. The biggest thing that changed that was having a family. When I got married and started having kids, I realized that there was something more important than my need to just be like a crazy person all the time. <laughs> and, um, and I started learning how to create some boundaries between myself and the work. I started to give myself some real structures and disciplines that would let me enter into the work and close out the work at the end of the day, because I didn't want to be like making dinner for my kids, crying about the thing I did the scene about three hours ago, right? I want to be fully present as a wife and mother, and I want to be fully present as an artist also. So it really does like a lot of working women, working moms, it requires an extraordinary amount of discipline to say like to my childcare folks, like, hey, for the next hour or two, I'm going to be in a scene where I'm turning my phone off. If there's an emergency, call this number or call my husband. Um, and then as soon as the scene's over, I turn my phone back on and say like, I'm back. How's it going? Do you need me? Great. Okay. I'm going to go back into my scene. Right. So that's some discipline on the parenting side, which is really, really hard. Cause I'm definitely one of those mothers who's like, I want to do it all, be it all, all the time. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, learning to have some of those boundaries with my husband, with my children has been really important. And on the other side, to create rituals for myself, for different characters, it's different things. There are certain characters um, where the moment I take off the ring, I say like, I'm now done playing her today, put her in a box. Sometimes I say a prayer in my trailer and say like, I'm done now today. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of meditation where I enter the space and exit the space, but I give myself markers so that the work is the work and the family is the family and I can have some sanity in both spaces. But I will say, when I'm done with a character, there is a different kind of goodbye. Because as much as I create those structures and rituals, they do live with me. They do live with me. They make me not crazy when I'm at home, but they're still with me in the shower, in the car, wherever I am. They're not as loud as they used to be, but they're still there. So when I finish a project, I do, I do find myself saying goodbye to the character, but I also am changed by the characters that I play. I always feel like a character comes into my life to teach me something or to challenge me in some way. So a lot of how I say goodbye to a project or sort of mark the completion, the closure, closure of a project is to acknowledge what I've learned from that character and from that piece and then move on. Really beautiful. So it has been amazing to watch you progress in your career, you know, starting with playing supporting roles in films like Save the Last Dance, to playing the wife of male Black leads in films like Last King of Scotland and Ray, to ultimately starring in your own show as a strong Black woman in Scandal. When you first started in your career, there were so few lead roles played by, by Black women. It just didn't really exist. But even then, did you have a dream, you know, of landing lead roles? And how did you make it happen for yourself? This is so funny um, because I, I, I think, as I said, I didn't, it's not that I wanted to be like a, a, a famous actress. I didn't want to be like the lead in a film because I wanted to be the most important person in the story. But I knew that I, as a woman and as a woman of color, as a black woman in particular, that I was deserving of having people like me be at the center of our own stories. And the fact that in the beginning of my career, I was often cast as the best friend mm -hmm. started to feel problematic to me. 
not because I didn't love working with these incredible actresses, you know, like Julia Stiles. And, but it was like, once I played Meg Ryan's best friend, who was like one of my heroes of acting in this film, very few people saw called Against the Ropes, but it was an extraordinary experience for me to work with Meg. I was like, I don't, I don't know that I need to play anybody else's best friend. <laughs> like, I'm not sure that I need to play anybody else's best friend. And I'm not sure that black actresses need to be relegated to the role of best friend. I think that we are deserving of having our own friends and being at the center of our own stories. And again, that's not to say that I haven't had extraordinary opportunities. And I've always tried to really bring the fullest humanity possible to playing the wife, whether it's Kay Amin or Della B and Ray or the best friend if it's in Save the Last Dance. Or, but at some point I was like, okay, I I'm ready to be my own character with my own story. And I was doing that in material that wasn't written for me to do that, but I started to hunger for the ability to do that, not just for myself, but for my community. So many of us, relate to what you're saying you know i mean obviously i've you know i'm i'm in a totally different industry but i've felt the same way it is a very male dominated industry very white dominated industry and it's so hard when you don't see people like you in those roles you know we don't see female ceos of color i mean growing up we there were there were hardly any um but it's it's like you said, you just focus on doing what you love and you show up and you work hard and eventually you believe that you deserve to be in a place to kind of change culture and tell your own story. And it happens. Well, I love that you're that you even are calling the podcast Hero's Journey, right? Because that's a paradigm, obviously, that we talk about so much in my business. And it really is something that we're so committed to at my production company is sort of reorienting ourselves around the idea of otherness because we for so long have taken for granted that certain people belong at the center of the story. And a lot of it has to do with that straight white male gaze um, and orientation. And what if we decide that everyone is at the center of their own story, that everyone is the hero of their own journey. What do our stories look like when we have a commitment to make that true? Um, so I really love that you have tapped into that idea with the podcast because it's true. You know, I, I am like so proud and honored to be a supporting character in the story of my husband's life, like so deeply honored and am happy to play the leading lady supporting actress in that story. But I also have my own story and he's a supporting actor in mine. And that's the gift that, that in life, we all deserve to be at the center of our own stories while uplifting and playing mentors or challengers or um you know part of the ordinary world and other people's stories right like in this my children on their hero's journey i'm back in the if we think about that structure of the hero's journey i'm part of their ordinary world i'm the world that they're going to break from and go beyond the village to to slay their own dragons and i'm so proud to be that i'm proud to play that supporting character in their world but they're going to do that best they're going to slay their dra dragons best if I set the example of slaying my own dragons in my life. Yeah, so well said, amazing. All right, so we are at our rapid fire hero's journey questions. There are four questions, ready? Question one, what's your favorite book about a hero? It can be fiction or nonfiction. I just finished reading Tarana Burke's memoir, Unbound, and I just loved it. She's such a hero of mine. She's the founder of the Me Too movement, and she's an extraordinary leader and survivor, and she is a true hero on a true journey, and the book is so fantastic. I'm also biased because she's from the Bronx, and so I feel like, you know, when you find a hero who's from the same places that you are, it, it resonates in different ways because it gives me extra courage to feel like I can be on my journey, but I just, she's such an important person and an extraordinary writer, so that's, that's the book I'll say today. Cool. Question two, what's your superfood? Um, my superfood is dark chocolate. Anything over like 70%, I'm 
powerless over. I'm obsessed. Um, it is my happy place. <laughs> and my favorite chocolate brand is this incredible company called Who Chocolates. They're, they have no refined sugar and it's organic and vegan. And they're, they're so, they're just delicious. I'm obsessed. Question three, what's your kryptonite? Yeah. Okay. My kryptonite, I think is, um, my kryptonite is avoidance or and procrastination. Um, those are the things that are most dangerous for me because I, I find that they can be a little bit, um, what's the right word? I, you know, pro avoidance and procrastination become really dangerous for me because they build upon each other mm -hmm. and they can sort of turn into a problem that's larger than the problem you're avoiding in the first place. <laughs> um, so I, I really try to avoid avoidance and procrastination <laughs> <laughs> very imperfectly, but I try. <laughs> Well, okay, this is supposed to be rapid fire, but I just have to ask, you know, on the topic of procrastination, I feel like sometimes as a creative, it's useful, you know, to yes. like, cause that you get some inspiration to creative ideas that you don't know that you'll get unless you procrastinate, but which I'm so no, maybe there's a part of you that needs that sometimes. No, it's true. I have seen some of that research. So I do, I try to be really intentional about like, what am I doing in this moment? If it's that I'm looking for more inspiration than to, to let go of the guilt cycle about it. Um, but to also be realistic with myself and look at a calendar and say like, when's the latest moment that I can work on this without driving myself crazy and creating a problem? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Question four, what's your secret weapon? I have to say my secret weapon is my family. Um, my husband and kids, my parents, like my, my family, the people I'm closest to are my secret weapon because they really keep things in perspective for me. I think that's one of the, the gifts of the pandemic, which I, it's been such a challenging time for so many people, such a, a really tragic time in the history of our planet. But one of the things that that I've walked away with is a deeper appreciation for having my family and for being able to be with them and to walk through life with them. Um, so, you know, whenever things in work in particular or in the world feel frustrating, overwhelming, um, being with my family puts it in perspective for sure. That is the best secret weapon and the best answer we've had on that question. <laughs> you are amazing. Carrie Washington, thank you so much for your time, for everything that you do to, to help our democracy, to inspire women all over the world. It's such an honor to speak with you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I really